This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, right, guys. We've got a special return guest on the podcast. His name is Eric Metaxas. He is a number one New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and conservative radio show host. He's written biographies of Christian giants like William Wilberforce, Martin Luther, and the great Dietrich Bonhoeffer. His autobiography of Bonhoeffer is on our 100 books every modern Christian man should read less. But he's also written some comedy books, some children's books, and even wrote for Veggie Tales back in the day. But we had him on last year on episode 248 to talk about his book, Is Atheism Dead?, which is basically a masterclass on, on apologetics and kind of looking at different things in terms of how atheism frames it versus what it is in reality. But today we're having him on to talk about a new book that is out. It came out like by the time you're listening to this, it came out in the last week. It's called Letter to the American Church. And so this is an important book. It's the shortest of all his books that I know of. His books are normally four or 500 pages long. This is like 140 pages, but he sounds the alarm on stuff that is currently happening in the modern American church as it pertains to the culture in America. And then specifically how that aligns with what was happening in the 1930s with the church there in Germany and what was going on with the rise of the Nazi party and the third Reich. And so if that seems like it's a stretch, I implore you to read this book. It is legitimately one of the best books that we've read so far this year. You will certainly hear me talking about again at the end of the year when we do our books of the year awards. But uh, in this interview, we spent a lot of time talking uh, about that. We spent a lot of time talking about what was going on and what kind of created the environment in the 1930s in Germany that led to that. But we spent a lot of time talking about why the church, why the modern church and specifically modern pastors are so cowardly on most of these cultural issues. And then they want to say, oh, it's because we don't want to be political or uh, we don't want to be seen as big as bigoted or as as unloving. You know, it's it's not really a gospel issue. Abortion It's not really a gospel issue. Keeping, you know, 14 year olds from cutting off their healthy breasts. It's not really a gospel issue that our southern border is just wide open and people are being taken advantage of it. Like none of those are gospel issues. So we dig a lot into that. But we talk about how the gospel itself has been bastardized so that these people can kind of get their Christian pacifist way of working working into things and how they're not really following the the Christ-like model of meekness. But then we get into not just lamenting what is, but how do we operate? What do we do? And so we spent a lot of time digging into that. So it's a really, really fantastic interview. But before we get there, I do want to remind you guys about our partnership with the Upper Room and the King's Council. So this is big time attention for business owners, entrepreneurs, and I know there's a lot of soon-to-be entrepreneurs out there as well. But the Upper Room and the King's Council, their mission is to create wealth and provision for the purpose of establishing God's covenant on earth. And so the way that they do that, because there's some places they're like, oh, this is how we do it. But they really do. And the way that they do that is that they give entrepreneurs the tools, the systems, and the frameworks that they need in order to really develop, but specifically deploy their God-given vision into the marketplace and how they can, you know, grow their businesses, you know, grow their workforce, all those different things. And one of the ways they do that as well is the upper room mastermind. So a lot of you guys have heard about these different mastermind groups, but if you're an existing entrepreneur or business owner that's looking for a tribe of people that are that are like you, that are like-minded, because that's really a struggle for a lot of entrepreneurs is finding people that are wired like you doing things the way that you want to do it and going the direction you're going in. This is a great group for you to be able to do that. They host these virtual and in-person events every month. They focus on business strategies uh, that allow you to increase and sustain your increased revenue. Uh, they have ongoing accountability. It's customizable to your business because every business and every person is a little bit different. I've actually spoken to this group. If you actually want some more information on this, go back to episode 355 of this podcast. We interview Riley Meek. He is the founder of the Upper Room and the King's Council. And so the name of that episode is the king entrepreneurship and money but also in that episode he talked about ways that you guys could get in touch with him so that you could see about whether or not the upper room is a good fit for you so this is what he said specifically for our listeners here text the words upper room upper room so that's u-p-p-e-r room r-o-o-m upper room to 727-472-3860 again that number is 727-472-3860 it will be in the show notes and when you do that you will get an application to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with riley meek and guys this guy doesn't have a whole lot of time for one-on-ones, but he was very excited about what we're doing here, and he really wants to partner with what we're doing here at Undaunted Life. So schedule that one-on-one -on -one with Riley Meek of the Upper Room and the King's Council. Again, that's Upper Room, U-P-P-E-R, Room, R-O-O-M, to 727-472-3860 to schedule your one-on-one -on -one with the founder of the Upper Room and the King's Council, Riley Meek. So guys, uh, 
Great, great interview today with Eric Metaxas. You know, it's a short interview and even the book's short, but there is a lot packed into it. So get ready, pack a lunch. We're going to get into it. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Eric Metaxas, welcome back to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. My privilege. Thank you. Well, hey, last time we only had uh, we had short time and we hit a grand slam. So let's see if we can go two for two with short time because you've got a new book out this week. It's actually today, the day we're recording it. It's called Letter to the American Church. So in it, uh, you're warning us about the real potential for something nefarious on the horizon. So what exactly are you sounding the alarm for? Let me be blunt. Let me be blunt. Um, I wish what I knew to be true was not true, but what I say in the book letter to the American church, and I beg people, uh, to take this seriously, the silence of the American church on all kinds of issues, uh, is exactly the same as the silence of the German church in the 1930s. People might think, oh, that's a dramatic parallel. You're overstating the case. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I were overstating the case. I promise you I know enough to know that I'm not overstating the case and that the German church was lulled into silence for exactly the same reasons that the American church has been lulled into silence. Many good people believe that I shouldn't speak out on this issue or that issue. You can name the issue. They say, I don't want to be political. Well, that's what they said in Germany. And these were not evil people. They were used by evil. They were used for evil purposes, but they didn't think, hey, I want to worship Adolf Hitler. Uh, I want to serve the devil. I want millions of Jews to be murdered. They had no clue what their inaction and their silence would bring about. And I really believe genuinely that the Lord gave me the assignment to write the Bonhoeffer book when I did as a warning to us today to say, this is exactly what will happen to you. It'll be different in many ways, but it's the same thing. You will be lulled into silence if you are not bravely speaking the truth into the culture whether you're accused of being political, whether you, whatever it is, if you do not do that, what happened there will happen in America. So I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, but then recently in the last year or so, I said, I have to write a short book. It's probably my shortest book explaining how it is that we could get here, why there are people today while we're having this conversation that they're convinced they shouldn't speak up on these issues. They don't want to be accused of being political. They don't want to be accused of being divisive. They might lose people in their congregations. They might drive people away. They have all these reasons. And I'm here to beg you folks uh, to take this seriously. I cannot, I cannot possibly overstate the case of what we are facing. Yeah, just finished the book yesterday and the alarm you're sounding is a loud one. And I can see a lot of the through points that we're currently seeing in culture. And specifically, as you brought it up several times there, Christians, but even more specifically, pastors not wanting to be political. So I want to read this quote from your book here, which by the way, guys, like this is one of your shorter books, maybe your shortest book, but it is, it is dense. Like get your highlighters ready. So let me read this quote. So those who behave as though there is nothing to worry about who seem to think, as such prominent pastors as Andy Stanley and others do, that we ought to assiduously avoid fighting these threats to be apolitical are tragically mistaken, are burying their heads in the sand and exhorting others to do the same. Or to put it another way, they are in the churches singing more and more loudly to drown out the cries of those in the boxcars heading to their gruesome deaths. Just a brutal line there. Let's keep going. Sing with us, they say. And don't worry about all those other issues out there. They don't concern us. Our job is to focus on God and to pretend that we can do so without fighting for those he loves whose lives and futures are being destroyed. So fantastic uh, some summation of what we're looking at right now where we have these modern, mealy mouth cowardly pastors not talking about abortion, not talking about LGBT, not specifically the T right now and the transing of children, critical race theory, biblical marriage, which is the only type of marriage. It's not called traditional marriage. It's called biblical marriage. Eric, we have accepted our place as downstream of culture while simultaneously begging the culture to love us without realizing that they will always hate us in the end. Go. 
Well, I mean, it's almost funny. I don't know if I mentioned it in the book, but the classic case is Tim Tebow, right? Here's a guy uh, who has been the nicest guy, the most wonderful witness. Look how he was mocked. He's still right? mocked every so, day. So people act as though, you know, if you don't talk about politics or something like that, you'll be fine. People will be attracted to you. Now, now, by the way, I love Tim Tebow. He's not guilty of what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is that people think that, you know, if if I if I just do the nice thing, uh, I think maybe Mike Pence thought that, you know, on January 6th when he says, well, I'm not going to do anything dramatic, like send this stuff back to the states. I, you know, I'm just going to do the safe thing. And, and the fact of the matter is people will hate your guts unless you do what they want you to do. So the idea that in the church will be more liked if we don't talk about this or this or this, I want to say bluntly, there are people who have made an idol of evangelism. They have this idea in their minds that if I don't speak about these hot button issues, it will attract people to the faith and then we can deal with those issues. Well, now, of course, in some cases, that's true. If you're having a conversation with somebody and, and you have discernment of the Holy Spirit, that I'm not going to talk about this issue or that issue because this is not the time. Mm. But the point is for pastors to believe, to take this as a doctrine, that we're not going to address what everyone in the pew is concerned with. Everyone in the pew is freaking out about what's happening in the country, that children are being sexualized. We have 5 million people, strangers, who've come across the southern border, many of them, of course, bringing fentanyl. We have drug mules. We have every kind of nightmare happening, but we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to be accused of being racist or whatever it is, some crazy thing that we're going to let people's nasty words uh, shut us up. And I think to myself, people have died for their faith. People have died for liberty. And, and we're saying, well, I don't want somebody to call me that name. I don't want somebody to say I'm being political. I'm being a culture warrior. And I think to myself, ladies and gentlemen, there are far worse things than being called names, being silent in the face of evil. Okay. When I think of the fentanyl overdoses in this country, what about those people? Do you not love them? Do you not care about those people? What about the people whose kids are, are being indoctrinated in their schools with Marxism, with anti-American, anti-biblical Marxist atheism, what about them? What about black communities that are being devastated by Black Lives Matter critical race theory? They're being devastated. The division is growing. If you are called to love those people, you are called to speak out on these issues. And when we have these siren songs in the church saying, no, we're not supposed to be political. Uh, Andy Stanley wrote a book about this, and I was blown away. I thought millions of people listen to him, and he is making the case it's a mess. I mean, it's historically inaccurate. It's biblically a mess. But he's making this really kind of rhetorical case that is going to mislead millions. And then you have somebody like Jim Daly, head of the folks on the family, gave it a positive endorsement. And I thought, these are not evil men, but they are misleading millions and I have to speak out and say, folks, what I write in this book, okay, Bonhoeffer w was saying this to the German church and good men, good leaders did not hear what he had to say. They said, no, 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 we're going to take a pass. We're going to keep our nose down. We don't want to get political. We don't want someone to burn our church down. We don't want someone to close our church down. We're just going to be silent on all of these issues. Those were the very issues. If they had spoken up, if they had shown their faith in their action and in their words, instead of just saying, I'm a Christian, but living it out as though they believed God would be with them, if they had done that, what happened in Germany wouldn't have happened. And I know the history, and I can tell you bluntly, I know what I'm talking about. It didn't need to happen. They, the church, was silent. And it is because of the silence of the German church that the nightmare of the Holocaust and other things happened. It is because of the silence of the American church that these nightmares are just beginning to happen and will continue to happen. I believe the Lord called me to write this book for those in the church who will have ears to hear. There are still many who are on the fence. They're confused. I beg them to consider 
what I write about. Well, Eric, you say in the book, if another three uh, to 6,000 Protestant pastors had stood up with the confessing church at the time of the rise of the Nazis, we would have never seen any of that gruesome stuff that we saw happen with the Third Reich. But even beyond that, you brought up a lot of different points. Conservatives and Christians are now uh, trying to actually fight back a little bit. And this is a rallying cry. I think this book is a rallying cry because beforehand, Christians and conservatives wouldn't find a hill worth dying on. And, and then they wake up one day and the war has passed them by and they realize, I never picked up my sword. I never picked up my helmet. I never picked up my breastplate. And and now society has passed me by. But to a degree, these guys like Andy Stanley, I wonder if he would have written that book had Trump never been president. And so I don't really want to get into the Trump stuff because you deal a lot with that. I want to ke- keep it to the book. But the thing that I find... Uh, it's, it's more than inappropriate is the bastardization of the gospel that we aren't going to talk about these things that concern people that carry the yep. Imago Dei for the sake of the That's gospel. Right. But I think right. what it's tied to, Eric, and I'll let you kind of weave this all together because I know you know how to, is Christian pacifism. So uh, you you talk about this in the book. They meekly adopted the stance that it was the Christ-like thing to submit and not to fight, nor even to mention such tremendously serious issues. It's a bastardization of the gospel, of the word meek, which is not weak and coward. It, it is uh, a tremendous amount of control under the, the guidance and direction of the Father. When you meek a war horse, you don't take away the war horse's ability to be a war horse. You put it in the That's control right. of the writer. So talk to me about how the bastardization of the gospel and Christian pacifism has kind of given us this witch's brew of nonsense. Well, right. And, and listen, we, we need to be clear, okay? This is not even a conservative issue. This is an issue of truth. This is an issue of truth. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does the Bible say? What does God require of us? I don't care what label you put on me. I am to obey God and God will judge me for that. If I say I have faith and I do not live as though I have faith, self-sacrificially, God will judge me. And so we have this siren song that, oh yeah, to to be self-sacrificial means to get the vaccine, you know, get a blood clot and die, get myocarditis, or just just go along with the crowd. That's what the German church did. They said, we just want to go along with the crowd. We don't want to stick our noses out uh, or we don't want to stick our necks out because we want to keep our noses clean. We really just want to go along to get along. That is not what God is calling his church to do. Let's talk about the issue of slavery. When Wilberforce, everybody who read my book, Amazing Grace, they say, oh, of course, I would have stood (laughs) against slavery. It's so obvious. What could be more obvious? Don't you think there were voices in that day that said, hey, Wilberforce, shut up. You and your Methodist, enthusiast, Jesus freak friends, why don't you stay out of politics? This isn't a gospel issue, William. And they, they said to him, it's not a gospel issue. In America, there were pastors who refused to speak clearly against the evil of slavery. This is a fact. I've been reading about it recently. They said, well, it's not a gospel issue. We don't want to be divisive. Folks, that's insane. There are things that God requires us to speak against injustice, against lies, against wickedness. And guess who did that? Jesus did that. John the Baptist did that. You have all kinds of figures in scripture who did that. But t- today, the voices in the American evangelical church, some of them would say, well, they weren't th- those weren't gospel issues. And I'm thinking, y- you are really very confused about what the gospel is and about what your role is. Your role is to speak up for those who have no voice, to be the conscience of the nation as a church. And so when wicked things are happening, There are all kinds of people. By the way, if you're worried about evangelism, that is going to attract people to Jesus. When they see bravery and when they see that kind of fearlessness, they say, what is that? Uh, We had that in the civil rights movement. Uh, When when, when Dr. King said, we're going to turn the other cheek, we're going to uh, do things that people are going to know God is with us because we're not fighting the way the world fights. We are simply going to... uh, do what we can, but we're not going to do nothing. We're not going to sit back and say, this is just the way it is. So when you're dealing with all kinds of injustices, you know, you, you really have to be brave, but when you're brave, you're, you're telling the world, God is with me. I'm not afraid to speak about truth because there are young women whose lives are being destroyed by transgender confusion. Uh, there are children whose lives are being destroyed by having this transgender pronoun stuff injected into their minds at a, at an age far before anybody can process these things. And the devil is 
like a roaring lion in our culture. And we have many voices in the church saying, don't talk about that. Just preach the gospel. And my question is, what dead pseudo gospel do you think you're preaching if you refuse to speak about the things that people in the pews are dying to know about? They want to know, I'm being forced to get a vaccine. Uh, uh, it's made uh, because of abortions made it possible. And everywhere I read that I don't need to take it. Uh, everywhere I read is that it's causing harms. I don't want to take it. My job is forcing me to take it. I'm going to a Christian school. They're forcing me to take it. This is madness. When you tell people not to talk about these things, they're going to find someone who's going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm telling you right now, we have many brave voices, uh, talking about this in the church and their numbers are exploding. Uh, pagans are coming to those churches and saying that those people are brave. They're talking about what I care about. You know, I'm trying to raise my family in this craziness. They have the guts to talk about this. I'm not going to go down, you know, to the Methodist church down the street that is like preaching, you know, the gospel of the New York times or whatever they're allowed to preach over there. We are living in crazy times. And I, I want to make the case biblically folks. This is not about politics. When people say that they're just trying to shut you up. This is about truth. This is about justice. This is about the church being the church. And again, if you don't believe me, you read my book and you'll see what happened to the Germans. The Germans bought the same lies, exact same lies about what is happening now. And you mentioned, Kyle, about that, you know, I say in the book, there was this thing called the Barman mm -hmm. Declaration and these heroic pastors stood against the Nazis, wrote this thing called the Barman Declaration. Well, by 1935, two years into Hitler's rule, the persecution had been so strong against vocal Christians that half of the number who had supported it or signed it vanished. So you had only really 3,000 out of the 18,000 pastors in Germany willing to strongly stand for the truth against total usurpation, the government trying to destroy the church, take over the church, only three of the 18,000. On the other end of the spectrum, you had 3,000 super pro-Nazis that, you know, that's like the Antifa crowd, whatever it is. These people hate the gospel, and we know where they stand. But in the middle, there are 12,000 pastors out of the 18,000 who refused to commit, who said, we're just going to see which way the wind blows. We don't want to get in trouble. We'll let those hotheads, the 3,000 hotheads, Bonhoeffer, we'll let them take the heat. We'll keep our mouths shut. It is because of the silence of those 12,000 that what happened in Germany happened. If any number of those 12,000, it, it could have just been a couple of thousand of those 12, if they had joined the 3,000 standing with the confessing church, with the, if they had done that, everything would have changed. I believe that's exactly where we are in America. There are people that the Lord wants to reach. It's why he called me to write this book and to say to them, will you stand? Will you see that what happened in Germany is happening now? It's exactly the same thing. You are drifting along exactly as they drifted along. Will you stop? Will you repent? Will you do what I require of you? If you do, you cannot imagine the disaster that will be averted. You cannot imagine the souls that will come to faith. We're looking at revival. We're looking at great things, but the silence of the church thus far has prevented it. So we are in an unbelievable battle. And the, the reason it's called Letter to the American Church is because this is not a case I'm making to my fellow Americans. It's a case I'm making to those who say, I'm a Christian. I want to do the will of Jesus. Uh, that is the case that I'm making. And I, I really humbly beg people to consider what I'm saying. Everything is at stake. We certainly seem to be at an inflection point. We'll make this the last uh, question of the day. It's kind of like, okay, so so how do we do this? Because again, you mentioned, you know, some people are just going to be branded. Oh, you're too political. You're too partisan. You're too hot headed. As they dismissed Bonhoeffer. Oh, you're just twenty something year old, and you're just kind of a hot head. But then we get into something you also describe in the book, which is perfect biblical masculinity, the masculinity of Jesus, the Jesus that went in and cleared the temple with a, a whip that he made. But God sometimes does things in a shocking way to show us his love. That, that's a quote from the book as well. But what exactly do we do? Because part of the reason why I exist and why the show exists is because pastors won't talk about this stuff. That's, that's right. why we talk about faith, culture, and politics, because someone's got to equip these men with the truth. So what do we do moving forward? Well, look, the first thing I say since the book uh, just came out today, I say, if you have a pastor that's waffling on this stuff, please give them a copy of the book because I do believe there are 
leaders who are not hearing what I say in this book. They're only hearing the siren song of silence. I, I really do believe that there are people out there who can be reached. And that's why this is not a book designed to demonize people. It's designed to reason and to say, please, please consider that that's the role we're going down. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is when uh, wh whoever uh, is listening right now, when you read the book, you will be galvanized. You will say, I have got to pray and say, Lord, lead me. Where do I speak up? How do I speak up? There are innumerable ways to speak up. If you're going to a church where the pastor refuses to speak up, I would humbly say, please stop going to that church. Please find a church where they are bravely taking on these issues and fighting the battle because there are pagans in your community dying for someone to take a stand for the truth. And they will come with you to the church where the pastor, you know, is a real man who's not afraid of being divisive, but who is doing this out of love for the lost, out of love for his flock, out of love for those who are confused. If, if you care about black people in America and you're not speaking against critical race theory, you're being cowardly because critical race theory is destroying black communities. So if you love people in those communities, you're commanded to bravely speak against critical race theory, even though you might happen to be white, it happens to be false. And you don't need to be a person of color to see that critical race theory is evil. Uh, uh, Vody Balcom has spoken about it. Innumerable people have spoken about it, but there's so many places where we can be tempted to silence. This is the moment that the church has to speak up bravely in every way we can. And there are innumerable ways. That's the joy. But folks, let's get busy because the hour is late. And where we are now, I think most people can see the drift uh, of things right now is just horrific. It is if, if, if it, I believe the Lord allowed things to get this bad to wake up those who could be awakened. And so that's my prayer that this book would reach people and awaken people. And they would say, okay, enough is enough. I need to repent. Uh, I need to start speaking out. And to the men and women listening to this, if you're not a pastor and you give your pastor this book, in addition to that, you give them this message, pastor, if you start talking about these issues, I will stand around you and I will take some of the slings and arrows that are headed your way. And then you get a dozen of your friends and y'all wait in the lobby and y'all go in one by one and say, pastor, if you start talking about this, we've got your back. That is how you will steal his nerves and steal his resolve. But that's all the time we got for today. I know you got a bunch of these to do today. Again, congratulations on getting this book out to us. That's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Just to say, folks, if, if you go to my website, there's a lot more information. Sign up for my newsletter. We're living in a critical hour, a critical hour. So my, my website is just my name, ericmetaxas.com. Please check it out. And Kyle, God bless you. Thanks for what you do. Yep, it'll all be there in the show notes, guys. Eric Metaxas, thank you for coming back on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thank you. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the return appearance of Eric Metaxas on our show. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And I just wanted to remind you, text UPPER ROOM, that's U-P-P-E-R ROOM, R-O-O-M, to 727-472-3860 to get an application to schedule your one-on-one -on -one with Riley Meek of the Upper Room and the King's Council. Now, the links I've got for you today, I've got a link to Eric's website. So we mentioned that there at the end of the interview. So you can go to that website, sign up for his newsletter and all that so you can get connected with him and stay connected with him but then i've got links to two books so letter to the american church that's the book that we uh that he just released in the last week and then is atheism dead that's the one that i mentioned and that's the interview that we did last year that's episode 248 which is in the show notes as well but also i got a link to eric metaxas's radio show so that you can listen to that there all right guys thanks so much for listening to this episode we do appreciate it wherever you're listening to this please subscribe rate and leave us a positive five-star review if you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast just shoot me an email to info at undaunted life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.